Come on in. <laughs> Uh-oh, now we're streaming live on YouTube. So everybody behave. I'll just Sally and I have to behave, which is never going to happen. True. <laughs> um, I'm going to give it another minute and then I'm going to start. You want to give me a little checkered flag wave when you're ready for me to go, Sally? I have a checkered flag. <laughs> Go. All right. It's 902. I think you can get started and I'm going to go away and I will. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to go away and I'm going to come back later. Good morning, everybody. Saturday morning, April 24th, 2021. And we are celebrating Independent Bookstore Day. We are so honored to have you all here with us this morning. Um, hopefully you're in your jammies and you've got your coffee close by. If not, feel free at any time to get up and get a fresh cup of coffee. I'm going to try to take a deep breath while I'm talking because I'm on my second cup. And um, as you all know, I have a lot of energy. Um, we are celebrating Independent Bookstore Day in, today in multiple ways. Um, you can find out all the information about how we're celebrating on our website at broadwaybooks.net. One of the ways is we're offering 15% off in store and um, online as well today. Uh, if you do your shopping online today, just use the code Love Indie Bookstores and it will work until midnight tonight. So 15% off in the store uh, on everything except for gift certificates and any of the independent bookstore day items that are special. Uh, you'll also see a link for that as well. Independent bookstore, the publishing um, arm of our business gets together and rallies a few special products for us to be able to sell in support of independent bookstore day. And I'm gonna show you two of my favorite the first is, um, I'm a pencil nut. You guys might not know this about me, but Blackwing Pencil Company has put together a very special independent bookstore day pencil. They're bright and cheery. It's a firm ink with their standard wide eraser. They are super cool. You can buy them by the box or individually at the store today. And we are thrilled to be able to sell them. One of my other favorite things, there's all there's lots of different products, you'll see them online, but my other favorite thing is this very cute little pencil pouch um, from an out of print company. And um, it is a way to award ourselves for the things that we might, um, the small moments that we need to celebrate during this pandemic. You get an award if you put on pants and you get an award if you took a shower uh, if you went on a walk or ate a vegetable or if you got out of bed, we're rewarding ourselves for the small things with this cute little pouch and uh, it's great canvas and you can put all kinds of things in it. So super cute. It's only $14. So you can get these online or in the store today as well. Um, Sally and I are talking about similar things this morning, but we're also breaking it up. And um, I wanted to start this morning with a little quote. So I'm going to do that. What an astonishing thing a book is. It's a flat object made from a tree with flexible parts on which are imprinted lots of funny dark squiggles. But one glance at it and you're inside the mind of another person. Maybe somebody dead for thousands of years. Across the millennia, an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding people together who never knew each other, citizens of different epochs. Books break the shackles of time. A book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. That was Carl Sagan. And that's my theme for my book suggestions this morning. I'm gonna talk again across a wide range of books, but I felt like the theme for me this morning was um, magic and humanity. And so you'll see that kind of woven as I'm talking. Um, I'm going to start off with hardcover fiction. Um, I'm currently reading Antiquities right now by Cynthia Ozick. Um, the time period of this book is late 40s, early 50s. There are, uh, the story is about um, seven elderly trustees from a former boarding school. The boarding school is now defunct, but they're all living at the boarding school in their old age. You're, you follow the story of one gentleman who um, they've all been asked to write their memories of their time when they were um, students at the school. He's taking it very seriously, typing all night on his typewriter. 
And uh, in the process, he's sharing stories of, um, he's a, she's a brilliant writer, he's a brilliant writer of the, of his, some, some memories that are unusual um, about his time being a student and a particular student that he met. Um, there's some satire and anti-Semitism and the Ivory Tower. And if you guys are fans of Cynthia Ozick, if you've ever read her before, she's fantastic and this book does not disappoint. So Antiquities by Cynthia Ozick. Um, my other hardcover fiction is Brood. And again, I think this one is another one that celebrates humanity. Um, this is a debut novel for Jackie Poulsen. Um, she has suffered, the main character has suffered a loss and you slowly, she slowly unveils um, the pain of her loss as she's describing taking care of four chickens in the winter um, of Minnesota. So she's keeping those four chickens alive and in the process of keeping those four chickens alive, she's explaining her own humanity. It's slow and thoughtful and humorous at times and charming and heartbreaking, but really only a bit heartbreaking. Um, the magic of our slow paced lives over the last year celebrated um, in Taking Care of Chickens. So Brewed by Jackie Poulsen. Um, new in paperback. If you guys haven't read Deacon King Kong yet. Oh my goodness, what a celebration of humanity. Um, I was just reading more of this last night. I am really loving this book. Um, the New York, um, the Bronx, in the uh, 50s and 60s, 1969, sorry, September of 1969, um, one of the, the local deacons um, walks into the middle of a park and kills a, a massive drug dealer. First two chapters. And I have to tell you, it is a powerful scene. And then how the whole community, the story unravels um, about the community and about what's happened to their community fantastic. Um, James McBride, if you've ever read him before, he's wonderful. And uh, this does not disappoint. So Deacon King Kong. Um, and also, I realized I've forgotten to tell everybody, but we have a link to all of these books. So you can write fiercely if you want to now, but we also have a link um, on the website as well. And if Sally has a just second, maybe she can post it in the chat to um, the, you can find all of these books on the link, what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to move now to Sally will talk a lot more about fiction and nonfiction for adults. So I'm going to do a little test or just a little taste of uh, nonfiction. I'm going to start off. This is a brand new book, Anthony Bourdain's World Travel. Um, many of us watched Anthony Bourdain for years and years and years, loved him for his honesty and his rawness as he was traveling the world. Um, he never wanted to make a travel guide. He never wanted to tell anybody where they should go or how they should um, experienced the places that he'd been, but he had gathered so much knowledge and so much information about so many amazing places in the world that he, um, he, a, and his assistant, Laurie Wolver, uh, needed to share. So this is a book that he had started and Laurie really pulled together. Um, and it goes through so many countries with very basic knowledge of literally how to get there and what to eat when you're there. Um, and then interspersed, so here's Hong Kong. I mean, he travels the entire world. He interspersed are um, bits and pieces from members of his family. This is his brother, um, Christopher Bourdain. A Child's View of Paris, the time they spent in Paris when they were children. It's magical. It's wonderful. Um, because it's Morocco, there's illustrations and drawings. Just it's, it is really, really well done. And these, this has been a hard year. We all miss traveling. And I think getting to travel a little bit through Anthony Bourdain's eyes and maybe a little bit through his stomach, pretty magical. Um, and again, as you guys know, Anthony Bourdain was one of the best people at celebrating humanity and the way we're different and the ways we're all the same. Uh, two other, oh, thanks, Sally. I just saw she just posted a, the book list in the book chat. Um, one of the other nonfictions brand new that I'm excited about is The Third Pole. This is the new one from Mark Sinnott, who's a climber in New England and has worked for National Geographic for years and years and years, helped other climbers 
write their stories, has been photographing and filming remote places for a long time. Um, and I have to say, so I said, asked myself, why, why this? Why another Everest story? This isn't, um, they're in search of some of their original, um, there's a mystery. And the mystery is that there were uh, two climbers potentially, potentially before Hillary that climbed Everest and they're looking for their bodies or one of the bodies. They found one and are looking for the other. Um, so why this story? Why another Everest story? And I, I gave myself three reasons. One is I think Mark Sinnott does a nice job of both the history and the respect for the mountain and the Nepalese, which I, I truly appreciate. Um, Mark Sinnott's an incredibly intelligent guy, and this is very well written, so it's um, a pleasure to read. And I think this is, again, like most ever stories, this is a really engaging story of survival and the limits of humanity. There's a lot happening on Everest right now, or has been over the last couple of years, with climbers being stuck and traffic jams and the number of people that are attempting to climb Everest. And I, I think he's very sensitive and thoughtful about um, the, the struggles and perils humanity faces with nature. So it's, I, it's the third poll, really, really good. Um, and the, my last, no, it's not my last <laughs> nonfiction title, but one of my last, Finding Freedom by Aaron French. Um, if any of you are from New England, you might not know this about me, but my husband and I moved here to Portland, Oregon from Portland, Maine. My youngest daughter was born in Maine. We lived there for several years and we, both of our families had had a history in New England. We had um, we felt a very strong connection to the land and to the people in Maine, and we really loved it there. Uh, this is a Maine story. So if you have family or friends in New England and have connections in Maine, you will find, you will see them in the story. Um, Aaron French grew up uh, in one of the small towns outside or in Maine, which all the Maine all the towns in Maine are small, uh, and her father owned a diner. She spent her child in the diner, um, got married young, went through perils of marriage and addiction and uh, questioning her own uh, purpose on this earth and has since, um, she and I was just telling Sally, this, there's an amazing section on her going to rehab and the, real, the realities of rehab. Um, and she ends up opening her own restaurant in Maine. And perhaps you've heard of it, it's called The Lost Kitchen. It's one of the most famous restaurants in the United States because the only way to get a reservation is to mail a postcard. They do a lottery, they choose who's gonna come. And those lucky people are the only people that they feed in Freedom, Maine for the summer. Um, and it is, so this is a very interesting story on her and her memoir and uh, it's beautifully written and it's full of grit and thoughtfulness and again, the magic of humanity. So I think Finding Freedom is a great story, Erin French. Um, I chose two gift books to talk about too with Mother's Day right around the corner or gifts for ourselves, graduates, thinking about the things that are coming up. Um, the first one is this one, it's called How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope. Um, I worried this was going to be kitschy, but it's not at all. The forward is by Ross Gay, which maybe some of you have read his books recently as he was the Everybody Reads for the spring. Um, this, this is a lovely, lovely collection of poetry, poems of gratitude and hope. Um, and it includes everyone from Tracy K. Smith, the Poet Laureate, to I just opened up to Marjorie Caesar. They're just, it's beautifully done, the illustration. Um, on the front cover, it's deckled pages, so it has a specialness to it, um, and the collection is really, really great. So I think, a, um, again, the magic of humanity, nice to have a time to stop and um, and enjoy poetry during uh, what we're hoping is a time of hope and gratitude. <laughs> uh, this brand new book from Lisa Congdon. Maybe you guys have seen Lisa Congdon before. She's a, now a local artist. She came from San Francisco. She's moved to Portland within the last couple of years. Her popularity has skyrocketed. She's written many, many books. Um, and what she, one of the things that she does is um, she shares her very pithy thoughts on posters and cards. You'll see her work everywhere now that um, I've introduced you to her if you weren't introduced to her before. Um, so you will leave a trail of stars. I feel like this is literally 
uh, the inspirational book that everybody needs on their coffee table. Pick it up. You can open it up anywhere. As you can see, I didn't even mark any pages because every one of them was so great. I'm just going to open up and we'll find the first one. Here we go. We are not free until everyone is free. So every one of these, some of them have her own commentary. Some of them, the golden way is to be friends with the world and to regard the whole human family as one by Mama Gandhi. So this is a beautiful, beautiful book. I feel like this is a, a collection of posters you would hang on your wall to inspire you when times are rough. I think it's literally the perfect gra graduation gift or Mother's Day gift or um, a reminder for the people in your lives who are having troubles right now, finding gratitude and hope. So uh, Lisa Carmen, you will leave a trail of stars. Um, so now I am going to take a sip of coffee. Thank you guys again for coming. Oh, I noticed Sally just put in the chat that the um, poems of hope and gratitude have several Oregon poets, which does um, the Staffords as well as others. That's a great, great, great collection. I'm going to move to, I'm going to start with YA. I have one YA title that I just feel like everyone should be reading. Uh, it's called The Firekeeper's Daughter, and it's by Angeline Boulay. Uh, this Angeline Boulay is a member of, um, I'm going to brutalize the name, one of the tribes that's outside of Minnesota. She's been in education for years and years and years. She's actually my age. Um, this, I, I actually think this is a book for everyone. It's not just for YA. The story is about an um, uh, older high school student who's graduating, deciding what's next. Um, and again, her family mystery unfolds. Her parents got pregnant with her when she was very young. At the same time, her father impregnated somebody else. So she's got a half brother, uh, how their story fits together, where they're deciding to go to college, um, what's happened. Their father was a big hockey star known as the firekeeper. That's why he's the fire. That's why she's the firekeeper's daughter. This is a very heartfelt, realistic story. The writing is fantastic. I, I think we're going to hear more and more about this story. And actually, I think it, there's been movie rights that have already um, been put out about this. So I think this is when you're going to, you're going to see this again and again and again. And I think you should jump on it as soon as possible. Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Boulay. So for any of the readers in your life, and actually, I think this would be a great book club book too. Um, I'm going to move to Middle Reader. I'm going to talk about a couple of local writers and then just some I you know I think kids have this has been a really hard year on our kids as everybody knows so I was trying to come up with stories that weren't too sad but were sad enough for them to not feel alone um this one in particular while I was away uh Wakati Brown is a local writer um and this is a story that she wrote uh essentially it's auto fiction um it's the main character's name is also Waka uh, she's a first generation American and she's got a great life, going to school, got her friends, planning for the summer, and her mother is speaking to her in Japanese. Her family's of Japanese descent. Descent. Her mother is speaking to her in Japanese and she is not responding. So her mother takes that as that she is not immersed enough in their Japanese heritage. And so decides on, at a moment to send Waka to Japan to live with her grandmother for five months, which means Waka is now going to school in a foreign country, trying to understand what life in Japan is like. She's gone from being cool and the A student at her school to uh, being the outcast in another country. This is a really well written and a really, really, really compelling story. So while I was away by Waka T. Brown, I think it's perfect for anyone from fifth to seventh grade, fourth to eighth grade, that kind of range. Um, this is my new favorite middle read novel, Tornado Brain by Kat Patrick. Um, you, this is told from the point of view of Frankie, who is a twin sister. Frankie and Tess, Tess is her twin. Um, Frankie's life is harder than her twin sister Tess's. Frankie is what's known as neurodivergent. Um, she's got some cognitive issues. She uh, hates loud noises, is easily distracted, um, and she hates to be touched. So she's on the spectrum. And uh, she has one very close friend that she's made, Clut. And she and Colette have a falling out. Colette goes missing. 
and how Frankie pieces that all together of what's happened to Colette, what clues can Frankie find to find Colette, and um, managing managing friendship and neurodiversity. And it's it's really well done. Um, this one is a little heartbreaking, I will admit, um, but uh, a well read for anyone who is feeling a little bit misfitty um, in middle school. Uh, so I think this would definitely be fourth through eighth grade tornado brain. For a little bit younger crowd, this is another, this is illustrated by another uh, local Pacific Northwest artist. Um, this is a story of Perry Rose, and she is also um, a little inventor, likes to make tiny robots. She befriends um, and what, a little, another friend who lives across the stream named Lark, who has a lot of the same interests as she does. Together, they're inventing these adorable little robots, but they're keeping it secret because they don't want any of the mean kids at school to know what they're doing. And their secret gets out a little bit. Um, and Penny Rose is invited secretly to join. Um, I'm trying to get the name exactly correct. The Secret Science Society. Uh, and Lark is not at the beginning. And so she goes to some Secret Science Society meetings. This is a really great book on navigating friendship and how to um, honor who you are and honor who your close friends are. And at the same time, they're making these adorable little robots. So this is a very charming book. And I've highlighted some of the illustrations as well. The illustrations are great. Karina Lucan is an award-winning illustrator. You'll see they found secret places to make their robots. So their adventures. And this is becoming a series. So this is a great, great, great Weird Little Robots by Carolyn Crimmy, And it's illustrated by Karina Lucan. Um, you guys may have heard me talk about this book before. I think I've done it at a um, at a, one of our holiday book chats. It's now in paperback. This is The Littlest Voyager. Um, this is a very charming story about a small red squirrel who watches every year the French voyageurs, French Canadian, sorry, French Canadian voyageurs, their jaunty red scarves and hats, sail off in their canoes, and he is sure that he should also be a voyageur, that he wants to go on this adventure. Um, and he finally gets the courage to jump in the boat and tag along. And as he's as he's he's on this adventure, he's befriended one of the voyageurs who's kind of looking out for him and making sure to throw a few, few little food scraps his way, saving some nuts and things for him. Um, he gets to their location. What the voyageurs do is they meet up with the trappers and they bring the furs back that the trappers have been keeping. What? The squirrel is freaking out. He cannot believe that's what he's they're doing. And he cannot believe now he is staring at piles and piles of pelts of animals. And he creates a little revolution. So this is a very fun and fabulous book, The Littlest Voyageur. Very well written. The story is very compelling. And I think this is an amazing read aloud. This would be a really fun one. So again, for that sort of first through fourth grade, someone could read it on their own, but it would be a really great read aloud too. It'd make for some very, very interesting conversations. So um, a fun one, The Littlest Voyageur. And now I'm going to move to picture books this season. I think since I've been in the book business, this has been my favorite season of picture books. There are so many beautiful ones. And if you have a minute to come by the store, we have every one of us at the store right now has some of our, our favorites that we're, we're talking about. I'm going to tell you about some of mine. Um, and again, this my the theme today is really the magic of humanity. Um, this one, Linda Sue Park has done one called The One Thing You'd Save. And this, I think, is not for, for tinies. This would be for sort of that first grade, second grade, um, the older picture book reader. Uh, this, uh, one of the premise of the story is that a teacher asks her class to, uh, what is the one thing that you'd save if your house was on fire, if your home was on fire? Uh, and if you, you can automatically assume that your family and pets are safe. So this would, the idea is what is, what are the things that are most important to you? And then slowly but surely, Linda Sue Park shares the, the details throughout the book um, of what the students have said. Some of them, and I'm going to read you one. Here's a picture of it. He wants, he's going to save his bedroom rug. Quit laughing. Try till you hear why first. 
if someone comes out of the building on fire screaming, I'm all ready with the rug. And I yell at them, stop, drop, and roll. Mrs. Chang said that family is safe. Lots of other folks in my building, like Mr. Richards, he's so old and, and slow, he'd catch fire for sure. He's burning up, I got that rug. I save him, I'm a hero. Hero, shoot, that only happens in the movies, not in real life. Okay, I know what you're saying, but what I'm saying is if there's a chance to be a hero, I'm gonna be ready. Um, and their stories are all like this. Some of them want to save um, something, you know, things that are that are uh, you would think kids would want to save, and some of them are really magical. And I just think this beautiful this book is really beautifully done and would spark lots of interesting conversation. So the one thing you'd save by Linda Sue Park. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is called I Am a Bird by Hope Lim. I just think this is a beautiful book, and I think in Portland especially. Granted, this story is told next to the ocean, but here in Portland, there are so many people that are biking around the city and taking their kids to work on bikes. I just think this is a beautiful celebration of both cycling and about what it means to be a tiny on the back of a bike. Um, so every morning she flies like a bird on daddy's bike. She sings like a bird on the way to school. It's kind of hard on Zoom to never get my directions correct. And she has, they have all these beautiful adventures as she's on her way to school. Every day they pass this one very cranky looking older woman who scares this little peanut. And one day they follow her and they get all the way to where, what is it that this woman is doing? As cranky as she looks and as mad as she seems, turns out she's feeding the birds. So here's this little, Tiny riding on the back of a bike, imagining she's a bird, and now she's seeing this woman feeding the birds in the park. So what, it's a way to rethink our first impressions and um, to find the humanity in each other. I am a bird. I think the illustrations are magical and charming. And again, this is by Hope Lim and uh, illustrated by Juan Young. So a beautiful book. Um, this one was brought to me by Megan at the store. I and I have now become completely captivated by this one. It's called The Midnight Fair by um, Gideon Starer. It's spectacular. So this is a wordless picture book. The premise of this book is that the fair, the carny is set, you know, the fair is set up. It's happening. The animals are in the forest watching all the people enjoy the fair. You can see their eyes at night watching the fair. Midnight comes and the animals come out and they spend the whole, the, the deep of the night hanging out at the fair, doing things that kids would have done during the day at the fair. And the pictures are spectacular. They're, they're uh, colorful and full of things to talk about and um, of magical scenes. And at the very end, the night watchman for the fair arrives and they all, sneak back into the forest. And it is a beautiful book. The Midnight Fair by Gideon Steerer. This is another gem um, that last couple of books I talk about. This is another one of my very favorites. Can I Sit With You by Sarah Jacoby. Um, this is such a magical little book about the friendship. So many of us have gotten pandemic pets. <laughs> and this is a celebration of that pandemic pet. Can I Sit With You? There's our little puppy with a stick. This book is just so magical. Neighborhood. Ask a question. I won't read the whole book to you. This is one of my favorite pages. If you're brimming like a ringing bell or if you're lonely like an empty plate. Can I sit with you is the premise of the book. So can this sweet little dog be your friend, keep you company? And even at times when the dog knows you've, you're not there. So if you hear another call or disappear from view, I'll understand the stray in you. It's in my nature too. This is a beautiful book and ends with the idea of, can I sit with you? No matter where you are in your life, I will be your forever pet. Can I sit with you? So again, this is, can I sit with you with Sarah Jacoby or Jacoby? I think it's actually how you pronounce it. Can I sit with you? And then the last one I'm going to talk about, and then I'll pass the um, baton to Sally. This is a this book releases on Tuesday, and it is one of my very favorites of the season. Keeping the city going. Maybe you guys remember Brian Brian Flocka is a um, 
is the illustrator and writer of a book called Locomotive that won the Caldecott several years ago. He is a spectacular, spectacular illustrator. And this is, he uh, lives in New York. And as the pandemic started, he was shocked by how the city changed so much and became so quiet. So he, um, like all good picture book illustrators, started to draw what he was seeing. We're at home now watching the world through our windows and wondering what will happen next. Outside we'd see the city we know, but not as we've seen it before. Um, and he ends up talking about the fact that the streets are empty, but who is out? Well, the people who are actually helping us care for ourselves, whether it's food deliverers. Oh, and this pictures of trucks are spectacular to subway drivers, to taxi drivers, people who are delivering things to us. Just maybe they're bringing that one thing we ordered that we really don't need, but we've been stuck here at home and we're bored, so we bought it. We'll try not to do it again. She's getting her dinosaur from a box. I just think this is a really beautiful and magical book. I think you know we all know that the amount of creativity and emotion that's come from this last year is going to um, spawn all kinds of creative endeavors in literature and illustration. And I think if this is any indication of what's to come, we are really lucky. So again, here's Brian Flacca's Keeping the City Going. Who's keeping the city going? Well, and that's a good place for me to stop. You all are keeping us going. Thank you. Thank you for honoring us on Independent Bookstore Day by joining Sally and I this morning. Um, we're thrilled to be your independent bookstore. And with that, I will pass it to Sally. Happy Independent Bookstore Day, everybody. Thank you, Kim. I'll see you in a little bit. Um, I have to concur. We do have so many wonderful new picture books in the store right now. Kim has really a spectacular eye for getting just the best ones in the store. And every time I walk past the pillar where she has new ones on display, another one catches my eye and I have to stop and read it. So Kim, my lack of productivity at the store is completely your fault. Um, and I would like to mention also that the 15% off also applies to Broadway Books t-shirts today. So if you don't yet have your Broadway Books t-shirt, you can go online and order one of those or get it at the store. Um, I am going to also do a little theme like Kim did. I'm gonna focus on fiction with an emphasis on local authors, um, music and science, because there's just so many new books in the store, it's hard to narrow it down. So I'm gonna start with one of my favorite local authors, Willie Vlotten, whose newest novel is called The Night Always Comes. Willie has won the Oregon Book Award multiple times and I'll be surprised if he doesn't win it again. I think that this new book is, one of, is probably my favorite of all of his. The novel takes place over 48 hours in a rapidly gentrifying Portland as Lynette desperately tries to achieve the American dream of home ownership, despite being dealt about as bad a hand as one could be, struggling against fate and circumstances. Is the American dream still attainable or is it just a hollow promise? So that's The Night Always Comes by Willie Flotten. Another local author whose book I adored this year is Vanessa Veselka, who wrote The Great Offshore Grounds. Um, this book was long listed for the National Book Award um, and is another exploration of people living at the edges and trying to survive in a capitalist America. People of deep humanity and shallow finances who are trying to find their way in a dysfunctional country. Um, it's been reviewed as a magnificent beast of a novel and a twisty, chunky yarn of a novel. Uh, it's in hardcover now. It will be out in paperback at the end of June. And then one forthcoming book I want to tell you about that I can't hold up because it's not out yet um, by another local author, Omar El Akkad, is What Strange Paradise, which will be out in late July. Omar is an Egyptian born journalist who now lives in Portland and his debut novel, American War, knocked my socks off. It was truly an amazing book. So I'm so excited about his second novel. It's going to be on another tough, uh, tough subject. This one is about the global refugee crisis through the eyes of a, of a young boy, a young Syrian boy. So that's What Strange Paradise by Omar El Akkad coming in July. And now moving on to paperback fiction, one of the 
paperbacks that people have been waiting and waiting eagerly for is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. This is a carefully crafted exploration of race, class, and privilege in America. And in the story, a young black babysitter for a well-to-do white family is accused by a security guard at a convenience store of kidnapping when she goes to the store with the family's toddler. This is a book that is so for our time. So that's Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. Another book that I really enjoyed when it came out in hardcover that is newly out in paperback is Greenwood by Michael Christie. This is um, a novel that is set partially in the Northwest. It's a multi-generational novel that opens in 2038 and then travels back in time to 2008, 1974 and the early 1900, 1900s with trees being the common denominator throughout. And even if you are suffering from what you might call literary tree fatigue with all the books coming out, uh, Michael Christie's novel is definitely one that is worth reading. And finally, another local author, this one might frighten you a little bit, but I encourage you to read it anyway. This is Faultland, hot off the press by uh, Susie, Viz Susie Vitello, who has written several books for young adults. And this is her first novel for adult adults. It's about the Sparrow family who lives in Portland, Oregon, and their relationship has always been turbulent, shaky, and full of cracks, and now the world around them is about to experience that as well, as the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake levels the city, and the family has to pull together to survive. Ah, it's a little scary. Um, and then another forthcoming book that I can't hold up. Um, it's another one of my absolute favorite novels of last year, Monogamy by Sue Miller, which is coming out in paper book, paperback on May 4th. It is about the complexities and absurdities of love, marriage, family, infidelity, and grief. And the two main characters are a bookseller and a photographer, two of my favorite uh, pastimes. It is character driven and beautifully written. I love this book. So look for Ma Monogamy by Sue Miller. And then I am also a huge fan of short story writing. And um, one of my new favorites is The Souvenir Museum by Elizabeth McCracken. I am such a fan of good short stories. And I believe that Elizabeth McCracken is right up there with Alice Munro and Laurie Moore as masters of short fiction. Her previous collection, Thunderstruck, won the Story Prize and was long listed for the National Book Award. One reviewer said the 12 stories collected in McCracken's The Souvenir Museum are skillfully crafted miniatures that feature unfailingly ordinary characters whose lives she uses to illu illuminate truths about love, longing, and the elusive search for connection. Whether they take place in Ireland, Texas, Illinois, Amsterdam, or Scotland, the marvelous stories in her impressive third collection evoke moving depictions of marriage and parenthood, love and betrayal and loneliness. And here are a couple of my favorite lines so far in the movie. His brothers had started to die almost the moment Lewis had left the house. He had turned out to be a load bearing wall. I love that line. Also, gravity is hilarious until it kills you. And in honor of this book, I made, while Kim was talking, two balloon dogs to match the cover. I'm kind of out of practice, so they're not really my best balloon dogs, but this is my fallback career. If anybody needs a balloon dog made, just let me know. Another one of my favorite story collections of the year is The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, by Disha Filia. This collection uh, won this year the Story Prize, was long listed for the National Book Award, and just last week it won the LA Times Book Prize for First Fiction. In this novel, in these nine stories, sorry, not a novel, in these nine stories, Black women and girls are caught between their church's double standards and their own needs for, and their own needs and passion. I won't lie, this book is hard in places and it is more than a little racy, but it is powerful and it is so wonderful. And it is also an excellent audiobook. If you are into audiobooks, I recommend Libro FM. This one is a fantastic audiobook. And then finally, my last fiction. I don't know how many of you have watched the Ken Burns PBS series on Ernest Hemingway, but 
I kind of thought, well, whatever, Ernest Hemingway, what else is there to say? But I found it really fascinating. And it sent me back to reading some of his short stories, which are totally different from the two books I previously mentioned, as these are more macho and shorter sentences. But he was a trailblazer in his way of writing short fiction. So now I'm going to move on to the world of music. And I've always been fascinated by books about the world of music. One of my longtime favorites is The Wrecking Crew by local author Kent Hartman. If you haven't read that yet, I recommend it. For whatever reason, this season, we are really blessed with a whole passel of books set in the music world. So I'm just going to highlight a few. And again, sticking with the theme of local writers, this one, Sonic Boom, is written by Portland author Peter Ames Carlin. And it's about the rise of Warner Brothers Records, which was an ex incredibly successful record company, which oddly had its roots um, with Frank Sinatra. But the president, Mo Austin, who was appointed in 1967, ushered in a counterintuitive business model that matched the counterculture of the times. His offbeat crew recruited outsider artists and gave them free reign while rejecting traditional methods of advertising, promotion, and distribution. And even as they set new standards for in-house weirdness, their experiments and innovations paid off to the tune of hundreds of legendary hit albums. Their artists included Joni Mitchell, The Grateful Dead, Jimi Hendrix, Fleetwood Mac, The Eagles, Neil Young, James Taylor, Prince, Van Halen, Tom Petty, and many, many more. I've just really enjoyed reading that book. It was fascinating. And in the book I'm reading now is Rock Me on the Water by Ronald Brownstein, which is both more specific and more broad as it focuses on LA in 1974, but talks not just about music, but also about the movie and TV industries as well as politics and how the action in LA at that time dominated and influenced the direction of the entire country. The book talks about the career paths of Jack Nicholson and Warren Beatty, who embodied the new and the old guards in Hollywood, respectively, despite being of the same age, and how CBS on Saturday night had what was called the best night in television with All in the Family, the Mary Tyler Moore Show, MASH, the Bob Newhart Show, and the Carol Burnett Show, all on one night. Musicians um, in LA at that time said that as opposed to the music scenes in New York and England, the LA music scene in the 70s was very open, inclusive, and collaborative. People shared songs they had written, they shared band members with each other, and they even performed on each other's albums. So that's a great book, Rock Me on the Water by Ronald Brownstein. And then in terms of uh, memoirs by specific musicians, if you'd like to Educated by Tara Westover, I recommend uh, Broken Horses, the new memoir from Brandy Carlisle, a singer who grew up in Seattle in a musically gifted and very religious but impoverished and dysfunctional family. Uh, despite not having graduated from high school and living as an out lesbian since age 15, Brandy has achieved tremendous success producing award, multiple award-winning albums, and her foundation has raised more than $2 million for grassroots organizations that she believes in. She and her super tall identical twins who back her up, uh, Phil and Tim Hanseroff, split everything three ways in their band, including decisions, money, and even the name. So if Brandy ever drops out of the band, then Phil and Tim can continue to perform as Brandy Carlisle. It's very unusual the way she is running her life. If, uh, if you like audiobooks, again, you might also check out the digital audiobook version from Libro FM, which includes Brandy not only reading the book, but also singing at the end of each chapter. Another strong female artist with a new memoir is Ricky Lee Jones with Last Chance Texaco. Uh, Jet, uh, Ricky Lee Jones rocketed to fame with Chucky's in Love and was crowned the Duchess of Coolville with her trademark red beret. With candor and lyricism, Ricky Lee Jones takes us on the journey of her exceptional life from her nomadic childhood as the granddaughter of vaudevillian performers to her father's abandonment of the family and her years as a teenage runaway, her beginnings at LA's Troubadour Club 
to her tumultuous relationship with Tom Waits, her battle with drugs, and longevity as a woman in rock and roll. And then finally, I will call out B-Swing by Richard Thompson. This memoir covers Richard's early years from 1967 through 75, the formation of his band, the Fairport, Fairport Convention, with some of his schoolmates, um, his revival of British folk tradition, and then leaving the band to, to form a duo with his wife, Linda, and his journey through Sufism. The trait that all three of these memoirs share is that these authors are not just great musicians, but also phenomenal singer-songwriters, and their ability to tell a story shines just as brightly in print as it does in their music. And then I'm just going to briefly mention two more musical-related books. Crying in H Mart just came out last this last week. It is a memoir about Michelle Zahner's uh, relationship with her Korean mother and her grief over losing her. Michelle grew up in Eugene. She now lives in uh, New York and performs indie pop music under the name Japanese Breakfast. This is a beautifully written and poignant book that I highly recommend. And you'll learn a lot about Korean food by reading this book. And then the last musical book I'm going to recommend is... Um, a Little Devil in America by Hanif Abdurraqib. And yes, that's how you pronounce it, Hanif Abdurraqib. Um, Hanif is known for his insightful books of essays about music. And in this book, he focuses on black performances by both well-known legends and little known performers. Publishers Weekly says Abdurraqib shines a light on how black artists have shaped and been shaped by American culture. His prose is reliably razor sharp and filled with nuance and lyricism. His luminous survey is stunning. And the author Jacqueline Woodson calls him one of the most brilliant writers she's ever read. So that's my little musical grouping. And now we're gonna move on to science. Science and Nature. So this is The Loneliest Polar Bear, which is written by Oregonian reporter Cale Williams. And it tells the story of Nora, an abandoned polar bear cub who was raised by zookeepers. Dr. Jane Goodall says, Cale Williams not only writes eloquently about little Nora and the dedication of the zoo staff, the Nora moms who save her life, but he also uses the tale as an entry point into important lessons, important issues of our times. Climate change that affects polar bears in the wild, the need for us to develop a more respectful relationship with the natural world and the ethics of keeping animals in captivity. Nora, I'm happy to report, has just returned to Portland after a successful experimental surgery on her leg. One of the most... Um, popular books of the past year has just come out in paperback, and that's Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. This is a fascinating journey into the diverse and extraordinary world of fungi. The book is written by Sheldrake, who is a British bio biologist. Michael Pollan describes him as a beautiful writer and a scientist with the imagination of a poet. And I would have to agree with that. The book is very sciencey, but very, very approachable. And then a book written from a journalist perspective, but on the same subject, is In Search of Mycotopia um, by Doug Behrend. Uh, this, in this book, the author presents a vanguard of mycologists, growers, independent researchers, ecologists, entrepreneurs, and amateur enthusiasts exploring and advocated for fungi's capacity to improve and heal from decontaminating landscapes and waterways to achieving food security. It demonstrates how humans can work with fungi to better live with nature and with one another. So now stepping away from the fungal world to the world of genetics, Codebreaker, this is actually an advanced reader, not the real book. That's why it's got all these funny marks on it. It is the newest book from Walter Isaacson, who is known for his thoughtful and thorough portraits of leading thinkers and creators. And so Codebreakers tells the story of Jennifer Dudna and her work in the development and application of CRISPR technology, which won her the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry 
along with her collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier. What I most love about this book is that Isaacson doesn't just talk about Jennifer's background and the science behind CRISPR technology, but he really gets deep into the moral quandaries that she grapples with as this technology opens up more and more avenues for scientific advancement. What is and isn't appropriate when it comes to genetic ed editing? Those are the big questions and to me, the most interesting ones. Last year, we had a very beautiful and informative book called Around the World in 80 Trees. The author has just come out with a new book called Around the World in 80 Plants, which is even more beautiful. Around the World in 80 Plants is a plant by plant journey through the plant world. And it is charming, erudite, educational, and aesthetically pleasing. Oops, like Kim says, it's really hard to hold these upright. A perfect gift to give to somebody else or to give to yourself. So that's Around the World in 80 Plants, which is out in hardcover. And I'm just going to, oh, I have to mention this book because this is written by somebody I used to work with. So beekeeping, along with making sourdough bread and all those other new pandemic holidays, is the hot new thing. Bee People is written by Frank Mortimer, who is somebody I uh, used to work with at Prentice Hall Higher Educational Publishing. Frank is a very entertaining and well-informed writer and beekeeper. So if you are into learning about the beekeeping world, I recommend Bee People. And then two books I'm just going to recommend that have just come out in paperback that were very popular, popular in hardcover, The Book of Eels and Why Fish Don't Exist, which I would put in the same category as H is for Hawk um, or The Soul of an Octopus. They're along those lines. And then I'm going to mention three books that are coming out on May 4th that fall into this category. Uh, one is called Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit. This book is written by Lyanda Lynn Hopt, who is a wonderful author from Seattle. And she read at our bookstore when her previous book came out, Mozart's Starling, which was a really fun evening. In her new book, she explores the notion that life on this planet is radically interconnected. Our bodies, thoughts, minds, and spirits are affected by the whole of nature, and we affect the whole in return. In this time of crisis, how can we best live upon our imperiled, beloved Earth? So that's Rooted by Lyanda Lynn Hopped. Seed to Dust is the new book by Mark Hammer, who is a gardener in Wales. For more than two decades, Mark has tended to Miss Kashmir's 12-acre garden. In this book, he describes month by month his year uh, as a year in his life as a country gardener. As he works, he muses on the unusual folklore behind his beloved plants. He observes the creatures who scurry and hide from his blade or rake, and he reflects on his own life, living homeless as a young man, his loving relationship with his wife and children, and now feeling the effects of old age on his body and mind. As the seasons change, Mark also reflects on the changes he has observed in Miss Kashmir's life from afar. If you like the books um, Late Migrations or Vesper Flights, I think Seed to Dust might be a book that would appeal to you. And then finally, the science book that I'm really the most excited about, which is also coming out on May 4th, is Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest by Suzanne Simard. You might have read an article about her um, a few months ago in the Sunday New York Times Magazine. Suzanne grew up in a logging family in British Columbia and was educated at UBC and at Oregon State University. One of the characters in Richard Power's masterful novel, The Overstory, is actually based on Suzanne. She is a pioneer on the frontier of plant communication and intelligence. Her book reveals that forests are social cooperative creatures connected through underground networks by which trees communicate their vitality and vulnerabilities with communal lives not that very different from our own, or the wood wide web, as some people are calling it. The Secret Lives of Trees was an eye-opener for many people, and Finding the Mother Tree is the next step in that exploration. John Valiant, who wrote another book that I really loved, The Golden Spruce, says that what this book reveals has implications and potential on the scale of mapping the human genome. 
And then finally, the last book I'm going to tell you about, which isn't a science book, but it's by the author of The Boys in the Boat, which I just loved. Daniel James Brown has a new book coming out called Facing the Mountain, a true story of Japanese American heroes in World War II. And I thought I knew a lot about this time period, but I learned so much more reading this book. And the author says that this book is a war book about as much as his previous book was a rowing book. Rather, he uses those settings to tell larger stories. Um, he explores the life of four young first-generation Japanese Americans to tell the broader story of cultural values, family, pride, service, and sacrifice. Um, he talks about the experience of being Japanese American in Hawaii when, Amer when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor the experience of being sent to concentration camps in your own country when you've done nothing wrong, and the experience of fighting overseas for your country while your family is in prison. So boys are the boys in the boat. Facing the Mountain will be out on May 11th, and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And yes, Molly, there is a list. I'll post the link again in here, but we have a list on our website of all the books that Kim and I talked about. I'd say one of the hardest things during the pandemic has been how to let people know about new books in the store. And we try to put, you know, some in the newsletter, but we can't do everything. A couple of tips I would recommend for you is um, to go on Instagram. And every week we try to post the covers of some of the new books in each category, uh, fiction, nonfiction, paperback, hardcover, and you can scroll through the covers and find something that's of interest to you. And we can help you track it down if you can't find it on our website to order. And the other thing is on our homepage of our website across the very top, you'll see a bar and it has staff picks, award winners, and book suggestions. And clicking on any of those will give you lots of uh, ideas of good books to read. And then finally, I just want to remind you about a couple of upcoming events because I didn't talk about those books today and in May. Well, actually, on Monday night, we have a poetry reading Monday at 430 with Charlie Selizicki and Brittany Corrigan, who will be reading from their new poetry chapbooks as part of April's Poetry Month. And then in May, on May 10th, we're going to be hosting uh, Whitney Otto and her new book, Art for the Ladylike. And then we have a great panel of um, novelists, um, um, May 24th, I think. It's on our calendar on the website. Anyway, Alex McElroy has written a novel called The Atmospherians, and um, they will be in conversation with Kimberly King Parsons, Chelsea Beaker, and Genevieve Hudson. And those events are all free. You just need to register for them to uh, attend and you'll find the uh, links for those on our website. And I'm just going to copy and paste maybe. Hmm. Let's see if I just do this. Paste, yeah, no, not that, not that, delete that. That will get you nowhere. We'll just go here, here. Actually, there we go. There you go, Molly. There's the link to the list of all the books that we've talked about. So, Again, thank you all for your support during this pandemic year, during all these many years. Uh, next April will be a uh, bookstore's 30th anniversary. So we are hoping by that point in time, we will be able to invite you all back into the store and have a ginormous party to celebrate. And don't forget to use your 15% off coupon either in the store or online, Love Indie Bookstores to get 15% off. and. There's Kim. She's back. Hi, Kim. Uh, thank you all so much and have a great day and happy Independent Bookstore Day. Bye-bye. Thank you.